bases dropped on an Atlanta United 3-1 win in extra time in the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup. It was not easy at Fifth Third Bank Stadium tonight for Atlanta against Charleston. I'm Jason Longshore. Hopefully we'll get some audio um, and some commentary from Jarrett Smith here in just a bit. Would love for you guys to be part of the show. Please share your thoughts on the match tonight over on Twitter at Soccer Down Here, and you can tweet at me at Longshoe. Let me know what you thought about the match, um, whether it was uh, the broadcast, whether it was performance, whatever you want to get into, please let me know, and we'll talk about it uh, as much as we can for at least a little while. Um, one thing I learned as I was live tweeting the match instead of talking through it was, man, it's a lot easier to talk through these things than to type through them. <laughs> my, my hands are tired. That's a lot harder to do. Um, it was uh, kind of weird watching this one and and not talking to Mike Conti about it um, as Atlanta United was, was battling. And, man, it just felt like one of those games where – you give up an early goal. Uh, bad decision to play out of the back in that situation. Um, you could fault Alec Can for not just blasting it long. You could fault Franco Escobar for trying to do maybe a little too much in that moment and turn over and you're punished. Uh, it's a great ball from A.J. Patterson. Ian Svonteson with an outstanding finish. And it's 1-0. From there in the first half, Atlanta United really punished Charleston consistently as the battery dropped deeper and deeper. First half numbers, 11 shots, three on target. Charleston had three shots, two on target. Second half was more of the same. Um, possession, 74% in the first half for Atlanta. It was 68 in the second. But second half, Charleston had two shots, one on target. Atlanta had 15 and seven. 12 shots from inside the box. They finally get the equalizer. Uh, it the whole sequence started with a Pitti Martinez cross. Miles Robinson on the back post gets a header after uh, Breno didn't handle it all that well. I thought Phil Breno had a really good night. He made 10 saves on the night. But on this one, he doesn't get it. Robinson with the header. It's probably going to be cleared on the line, but Romario Williams pushes it home. It's not pretty. 79th minute, you get the equalizer. You don't care how it looks. You get to extra time, and it looks like the legs are going at this point. But up steps Brandon Vasquez, who has had success in the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup for Atlanta United before. 110th minute, great ball chipped in by Justin Merrim, and Vasquez continues his run. There's miscommunication between Taylor Mueller and Breno. Vasquez gets a touch in between the two and slots at home. That gives Atlanta the lead. Charleston went for it as they had to in this moment and forced Alec Cannon to a big save. The follow-up by Nick Daly was offside, and they showed replays. He was off by about a step. Then, next chance Charleston gets, Dante Marini, just a beautiful little delicate chip over the top, and the chance goes off the bar at the end of it uh, from Basua, who came in as a substitute. And Atlanta then goes down the other way as you get into stoppage time of extra time. And Brandon Vasquez, 121st minute, puts it away. Justin Merrim. I thought Pitti Martinez probably deserved another secondary assist. Doesn't really matter here. Plays Merrim in. Merrim with a great ball on the ground to the back post behind the back line. And Vasquez slots at home to give the 3-1 win to Atlanta United. It was uh, it was an open cup match. That's that's what it felt like. It's a one game, winner take all, and it levels the playing field for lower division teams. Charleston Battery came in with a game plan. They pressed a little bit more than I expected at times. Uh, their three four three shape is it's a little awkward for teams who are not used to playing against the Battery because they don't play it in a traditional wing back on the outside of the midfield format it's really true wingers and it can throw you a little bit and that's where I think Escobar caught in possession the giveaway hurts him and Charleston then maybe a little too early 
sits back and drops back. I mean, it's hard to argue with it because they held Atlanta out for a long time. But you look at those numbers, and it's just a lot of chances for Atlanta United. Let's let's go through some of the individual numbers before we get into the Twitter thoughts. So I'm going to have to do some addition here, and I don't have a calculator handy. Chances created by Atlanta United. Let's see, that's uh, 16, that gets us down to 21, that gets us to 25, and then that gets us to 29 chances created by Atlanta United. Key passes, uh, according to Opta, eight of those were from Pitti Martinez. I thought Pitti Martinez was outstanding in this match, and I know there was some criticism of him in the first half that, honestly, I feel like was, was unfair. He was better in the second and if you couldn't pick up the body language from him for a player who was purchased, as we learned this week, the official number, $15.05 million, for a player purchased for that to come out on a Thursday night after the game gets rescheduled from a Tuesday back and forth on a bus ride and to come out and put forth that kind of effort when you've seen it many, many times, Star players in that situation, ah, it's open cup, doesn't really matter. Let's just chalk it up. Bad luck, bad night, no big deal. You didn't get that at all from Pitti Martinez. He was chasing everything down. Ball goes out. He's sprinting after it to get to get it back into play quickly. He's trying to force the play. I, I was so impressed with Pitti Martinez. Six shots on the night, three on target. Uh, forced some big saves from Breno. I, I thought Pitti was, was outstanding. Next on the chance creation list, Breck Shea and Justin Merrim. I, I thought Breck had a good first half. I thought he had a really good first half. I thought he ran out of gas a little bit as the night went on. But four good chances from him created. Justin Merrim, in limited time, created four chances. And, and I thought Merrim was, was very good. Had uh, some chances of his own as well. Three shots. Didn't put one on target. One was a very good shot from distance that was just slightly wide. Then, three sh- three chances created for Darlington Nagby. That's about normal for him. Franco Escobar, who came out at the 105th minute. couple chances created from him. Jeff Lorenowitz, Andrew Carlton also created a couple of chances. I thought Carlton started well and, and wavered a little bit as the night went on. But I didn't think it was a bad night for Andrew Carlton at all. It just wasn't maybe the blow-away night you were hoping for. I didn't think he hurt himself at all. I thought if anybody had a, an off night that was noticeable. It was Dion Pereira, who just really kind of struggled to find the pace of the game outside of his 1v1 opportunities, where he was dangerous, as you would expect. Um, put defenders on their backside multiple times, but unable to really get more going than that. Um, you dig into the numbers, and the passing accuracy is very high for a number of Atlanta players because Charleston dropped off and, and gave them a lot of passes. Uh, total passes in the opposition's half. Darlington Nagby had 83 and completed them at 93%. That's about what you would expect. Pitti Martinez with 23 crosses from open play because he was drifting out and putting in good service. Nine of them were considered good crosses. Ten from open play, four good crosses. Um, a lot of those cross numbers are from set pieces and corners. Again, I, I think Pitti had a good night. And I know I'll get some pushback on that, and that's okay. I'd love to talk about it. Tweet at me at Longshoe. Tweet at us at Soccer Down Here, and we go from there. Um, let's get into some of the thoughts on the Twitters. Uh, Jarrett Smith is trying to get some post-match audio for us. We're trying to get Frank DeBoer's post-match comments, and then Jarrett will join us um, in a little bit. So stay tuned for that. <laughs> pay no mind on twitter asks if i heard the solo drummer outside i did not hear it on the broadcast um i did see other references to it though now there was some confusion from uh the commentary on the broadcast about the situation with it being a closed door match uh they said that it was because of this was supposed to be charleston's match and if that's true, then the press releases that were sent out by U.S. Soccer, by Atlanta United, and by Charleston Battery were all incorrect. Uh, the press releases were consistent in saying that there was not time to adequately prepare for staffing, for security, for ticketing on short notice. The announcement was made at about 5.30 yesterday. It's about 20, 
five and a half hours from when the announcement was made, and we don't know when it was finalized before that. Look, I'm just going by what was reported in the uh, the press releases. So I don't believe that that was the case in terms of they decided since it was supposed to be Charleston's game not to allow spectators in to, I guess, that would have benefited Atlanta. Would it? Yeah, absolutely. You have the home field advantage. You're going to get that crowd. Sure, definitely. But I don't think that was the case. If it was, again, the press releases uh, had wrong information. That's all I can go on. Um, so that's why there was a solo drummer outside instead of inside. It was weird to hear all of the on-field stuff. Now, now we've been in some venues calling games before where it's quiet and you can hear some of that in our radio broadcast. But this was one that was, I mean, you could hear clearly Mike Anhauser from the Charleston battery bench with some very specific things that were being said. Um, it's also a few, uh, bits of colorful language that you could hear as well. Um, it happens. Welcome to pro sports. Uh, Bobby Jaworski on Twitter says Atlanta has the roster and the talent. It's not a surprise that we came back, but we have to look at the lineup again before taking on the crew. Vasquez, Merrim, Pitti, and Nagby stood out. Defense was way too slow playing from the back. Um, and Bobby started it with, shouldn't have even been close. Look at the stats, plus 70% possession, over 30 shots, more than 10 shots on goal, not to mention all of the corners. The corners ended up... I meant to check that one. Um, corners ended up 17 for Atlanta. <laughs> That's a lot. Uh, solid defense can be upended by moments of sloppy play. That was the reason for the goal and the chances late for the battery. Chances late for the battery, I think, were tired legs as well. Um, yeah. I mean, good play can be upended by sloppy play by a moment. Absolutely. And we haven't seen as much of that as of late from Atlanta United, but... When you have the break that you did and you have this just weirdness of you have five days off after the Chicago game. You come back to training on Friday. You train Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, get on a bus, drive to Charleston, walk around. You don't have a training session. You have everything that happened Tuesday night. You get on the bus, you drive back Wednesday. I don't know if there was any regen or anything like that. And then you play on Thursday. Rhythm and sharpness are going to be an issue there. And that's why I think it was probably the safer play in that moment where Atlanta getting conceded the goal to play long, to play simple. If it's Alec Can bombing it long initially, that's fine. If it's Franco Escobar under pressure, uh, putting it into the empty stands, that's fine little too risky in that moment without being truly sharp. And it, it hurts you. Now, some of the stats, some of those numbers are down to the, the state of the match because Charleston with the lead is able to just sit back and conserve energy and get numbers behind the ball and give away all that possession and even give away some of those shots. But I, I disagreed with some of the comments on the, the broadcast about Atlanta being very predictable. Look, it was successful. They were forcing saves. And I think it's a, honestly um, kind of disrespectful to the, the performance of Phil Breno and Goal, who I thought had a really good night. Ten saves, that's a good night at the office. And they weren't all easy saves. So it's kind of... I don't know. It's funny to me that it's it's predictable, but what it does is it wears a team down, and you get the goal from it. And you created a number of chances after it. There was a sequence where uh, there was talk about it being a predictable buildup again, and Pitti Martinez puts a ball in the back post that Justin Merrim heads into the ground, and it goes over. It was a beautiful ball from Pitti, and Merrim's got to bury that. It, yeah, if it's predictable and it works, that's not a bad thing. That was just a, a weird little quibble with it. I did not see it as being as predictable. I saw it as Charleston sitting back and Atlanta was taking what the match was giving them. They had chances, they created chances, and they finally got the breakthrough. It's why you don't need to concede early. It's why you don't need to, to give up the goal that you did in the moment you did. Michael Valverde, tough watch with no energy from a crowd. They had moments of spark, but not nearly enough. Glad we won because it was never sure until 120 minutes. That's the cup. I mean, when you're the Charleston Battery, this is the potentially the biggest game you're going to have this season. 
you know, this is a team that has been struggling as of late. You can you can get good, you can get right with a good cup performance. And Charleston put a lot into this. And they did a lot to win this match. They were, I don't know if I'd say organized, but they were very, very diligent on the defensive end. They worked hard. Even when the organization broke down a little bit, they worked hard. They scrambled. They fought. Taylor Mueller, Jared Van Shake, two veterans in the back. I thought they had good nights, except for the the Mueller Breno miscommunication. Uh, I was impressed with Kyle Nelson, a player that I wasn't all that familiar with coming in. I thought he was was good and and handled the moment pretty well. Um, for Charleston, something that did hurt them was Karen Mason having to come out ten minutes in. Angelo Kelly comes in. Kelly was good on the night in the central midfield, and he was paired up with Vincenzo Candela. Candela, very solid. I mean, it was not easy for Atlanta to attack down the middle because Charleston, they get very compact with their 3-4-3. It's not a very wide 3-4-3. It's a kind of a narrow one, and they pack in the middle of the field. That's why Pitti Martinez was finding most of his opportunities to deliver crosses and try to create chances from a wide position. So Charleston did what they came in to do. They got a goal, and they sat, and they defended, and they made life difficult. It nearly worked. It didn't completely work, and then they didn't have the quality to, to find the way back in. And that's where, if you're Atlanta United, you do lean on your quality. You lean on a player like Pitti Martinez to lead you in these moments. Uh, Cole Smith chimes in to a conversation about... Uh, G Rod asking, is Romario Williams worth a roster spot with Vasquez? And Cole says, agreed. Vasquez is more versatile, plays the number nine in the wing, and has more sell on potential if things keep moving up for him. We've been rooting for him since he got signed. Williams has been very good up until his injury late last season. Williams in 2017 on loan with the battery was a double-digit scorer. 2018 came in early on, was a very good piece off the bench for Atlanta United, coming in late into games. He came in at Yankee Stadium and, and gave, you, gave you a good 45 minutes. Came in in Columbus last year in the middle of the summer and gave you, I believe, another good 45 minutes. Williams started to struggle late in the season. Then he had the injury. He was kind of turning into a bit of a closer coming in late, being a big body up top. If he could put together a little more consistency, I I think Romario Williams would be a nine that would start in Major League Soccer. I, he And it, maybe it's just the playing time. It's just the rhythm. But he struggles to put back-to-back -back good performances together. Um, he had a, a, a rough night, I thought, on Friday night with Atlanta United, too. He was much better tonight, and full credit to Romario Williams for battling it out at the end. I'm not sure what the injury was. Looked like a groin injury just from the mannerisms, and he was hobbling as the game went on. But Atlanta had already used their final substitution in extra time. Michael Parker came on for Franco Escobar in the midway point, and Williams had to gut it out, and he did. And there was a really good bit of hold-up play from Williams in stoppage time of extra time that was very intelligent and the smart thing to do. And sometimes that's difficult when you're in pain. Full credit to Williams for that. Now to Vasquez. Brandon Vasquez, his injury issues this season have kind of made it an, an up and down year for him. He had a really rough night at the office in front of goal in Charlotte for Atlanta United 2 earlier this year. And then he got hurt. He's just starting to come back. He gave you a good 10, 15 minutes against Red Bulls, too, I thought, until he kind of ran out of gas playing at that speed. I was a little bit worried about as many minutes as he was coming into play tonight. He lived up to it. He was very good in front of goal, didn't waste any touches, worked hard. Vasquez, who we've usually seen, Tata Martino liked playing him out wide. Since Frank DeBoer came in, Vasquez has been the number nine that he was before Tata Martino got him. At Cholos, with U.S. Youth National Teams, Brandon Vasquez was a number nine, a striker. Under Tata Martino and with Atlanta United, he had generally been a right winger. So it's been interesting to see him back up top. He came on to give you two up top as you were really pushing for an equalizer. And I... 
I thought he adjusted nicely once you got that equalizer to playing a little bit of a different role and having to do a little bit more than just be a second forward. Vasquez was really good tonight. Both of them are important for this team because they're depth. I don't know if either one is truly established as the guy behind Joseph right now. And you have a match coming up on Tuesday in Columbus. It'll be interesting to see one, Williams, after going down in this match, is he going to be ready to go on Tuesday or is he going to have a groin pull that needs a little bit of time off? If he if he can't go, is Vasquez ready to give you 90? And that's another question. I'll have to wait and see on that. Outside of those two, it's Gordon Wild would be the other option. I thought he might come in tonight. Didn't see him. Gordon Wild would be the other option. So... Keep an eye on the injury report for Atlanta United and keep an eye on Romario Williams' availability when it gets down to Columbus. Let's uh, let's keep getting into the Twitters and the thoughts. All right, we'll get some more uh, commentary here in just a little bit. Um, scrolling down, Eric Jason Cross on Twitter says, Disappointed in what I saw from Carlton. He seems to have lost his spark, which is what I enjoyed about his game. Pitti had a lot of good crosses. Apart from that, it was hard to watch at times. Not sure what the game plan was. There was a lot of talk at halftime, like the last comment from Eric here, about it was hard to watch. It was, it was, they didn't have a, a plan. Things like that. I, I, a lot of the talk on the broadcast was about it being too predictable. Like I said, I disagreed with that. The game plan got changed when you gave up a goal in the 20th minute. That's a big part of this. You can have a great game plan to to do all kinds of things. You give up a goal, and the opposition who wanted to come in and defend anyway, that makes it easier for them. Your, Your night just changed. So that's a big part of why the game was what it was. Hard to watch. I I mean, again, you, you created a ton of chances against a team that was sitting back. You had 11 shots in the first half, 15 in the second, 12 shots on goal overall. There's not a lot more you could have done. I mean, I'm I'm trying to come up with some different solutions that you could have done to change it earlier. By the time I would have thought about changing things, you were really starting to wear Charleston down. I think the subs were were 100% correct. I thought they they did change the game when Merriam and Remedi came in. When Remetti came in and Pogba stepped out, that was an opportunity for basically Jeff Lorenowitz to play as a stopper, kind of as an old school stopper in front of Miles Robinson. Um, it was different. I mean, he kind of had to at that point. Remetti came in just to push the game in the middle, and, and Lorenowitz would drop into the back line when he needed to, but he played in front of Robinson, and Robinson had a bunch of 1v1 defending to do and did a good job. Breck Shea, again, a lot of criticism, but he stepped in and kind of slid in and played a little bit more as a central defender when he needed to. I didn't, I didn't, I don't really know what else you could have done when, when Eric's comments like that about it is hard to watch at times. When you give up the early goal, this is what happens. And this is why the first goal is so critical. One number we can throw out of the board, at least when it comes to all competitions now, is that Atlanta United hasn't won a game this season when they conceded first. Or hasn't won a game when they've conceded. Well, that can that can go away now. Atlanta United fought back and got the win here. Sometimes that's how games go when you give up a goal first. Uh, Pitti, yeah, a lot of good cross. I mean, I think you saw the quality of Pitti Martinez tonight. I it's really hard to. I I feel like it's hard to criticize him tonight. I feel like it's it's kind of unfair to criticize him after the night he had, but. I'll be curious to see what the takes are about him. We are getting audio in right now from Jarrett Smith at Fifth Third Bank Stadium. It is uh, uncut, and we're just going to see what we get. First up, Justin Merrim after the match. Yeah, for Justin. <laughs> Go ahead, guys. This is probably one of the most unique matches you've ever played. In terms of... Um, being an empty stadium. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Obviously, that's not uh, ideal, but um, and it was such a 
short um, turnaround. You know, we did as much as we could. What did you think of the stadium in Columbia? The, the, I said that again, Charleston, <laughs> uh, with the turf being the state that it was. What was your reaction when you first saw Out it? Out there in Charleston? Mm -hmm, yeah. yeah, obviously not um, ideal. But, um, you know, we were focused. We would have played on it and, and, and tried to dig deep to get a result. What was the feeling out there today? Did you feel like training, scrimmage, what the, just the atmosphere? No, nah, it was a game. You know, you have to be locked in. Obviously, not the best start for us. Um, but I thought, um, you know, we, you know, dug in there and found a way to get a result, which was, which was promising. Got two assists yeah. tonight. Um, could you just go through each of those, please? Uh, just trying to make up for the miss, the header. So um, short-term memory with me, just want to get back on the ball. And I felt comfortable, and Brandon was making some good runs and, um, you know, made some good passes and, you know, great finishes by him. What would you attribute the slow start to? Just the travel, the uncertainty? The new I think there's a lot of things. Just the way that everything kind of um, has happened the past couple of days, busting over there. Game gets canceled, come back, game scheduled back on, close to the fans, so kind of just everything, but not. I don't want to make that an excuse. I think we just have to be better, better mentality going in and give them some credit. They came in, I think they were pretty sharp. Their big man, number nine, was a, was a handful, and it was a great finish by him. So sometimes you got to you know tip your hat off, but we also have to be better for sure. Going, going back to um, Columbus on Tuesday, it has to be – Really emotional experience where you go to Max Engel friends. Yeah, that's um, you know a place where my career has developed, and you know I owe that city a lot, uh, maybe everything for from my career, and um, you know always will be grateful. But you know I'm with Atlanta right now, and my focus is to help the team as I did tonight. Have you actually moved from there yet? Yeah, I moved. Okay. <laughs> I'm living at Brandon's apartment. Uh, <laughs> that, that, the, 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 yeah, because you were He's, trying to get in with Parky. Serious. Par Parky wouldn't let you in. Yeah, either. his fees were too high. I'm beginning to wonder about you. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the second assist to Brandon. Did you see him making the run, or were you just trying to put it into space at that back post? No, I saw him making a run, and uh, it, it was a great pass, great finish. It, it was just a heads-up play. Um, it's one of those you, you know, I don't even think I took a touch. It's mm -hmm. you, you play it first time and you let your striker get to it. So, mm -hmm. okay. The first half, it seemed like they were really bunkering down, having you know, two or three guys back to, to yeah. react to that counter attack. What did you see differently out there that was able to get the goal and then ultimately you know, two others? I just saw for myself um, watching the first half, we had to make runs behind, and that's what I was doing to kind of just pull, pull either the outside back or, or the center back, and that leaves pockets for other players. Um, but once we started making runs um, with, with Franco out wide and, and myself and, and Breck, so once you start making those runs, then they're going to have to start pulling wide and stop staying so, stop staying so compact. Um, that allowed us to, um, you know, make some passes and get it behind them. Obviously a win's a win, but is there a difference between an MLS league play versus a U.S. Cup? Is there less pressure in a game like that, or does it feel different? No, but these games sometimes are harder, you know, harder to get up for. They're going to, you know, put everything out there. This is, you know, their biggest game of the year, so they're going to come out. And for us, we, um, you know, sometimes the mentality, because it's not an MLS team, but um, give them credit. They, um, they, were, they, were, they were great, and, um, you know, kudos to them. But um, at the end, we, um, you know, found a way. Did Frank give you any specific instructions based on what Charleston was doing other than just, you know, get forward, <laughs> pass, and move? No, just to go out there and, um, you know, know how to play. And, and, you know, I've been around a long time, and i played a lot of Open Cup games, and I felt comfortable out there tonight. It was good to um, finally get significant minutes under my belt. Yeah, Last I was going to ask you about just was this the best-case scenario for you to come off the bench and make an impact to show what you can do for a future? You know, that's what every, um, you know, player is asked to do when, they're, when they don't start. Um, how can you change the game? How can you come in and contribute and help the team? And, um, you know, fortunately, I think all subs did that tonight. All right. Thanks. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you to Justin Merrim, and thank you to Jarrett Smith for collecting that audio. And Jarrett joins us now from a parking lot, it sounds like. Yeah, uh, walking by the coach bus, which just carried a team, and which will carry a team home. And uh, I think that's Charleston's bus. I'm not positive. Actually, let me check. No, I think that's Atlanta's bus. I don't even know, man. 
<laughs> How weird was it tonight with uh, no crowd? If you go back and listen to that game and your kids are in the room, that's irresponsible. That's that, irresponsible. Yes, that is true. There was some language tonight. Uh, there was there was a lot of language tonight. There were a lot of emotions. Um, it was just a weird game. Uh, you know, uh, Frank Tabor talked about, you know, it, it, it can be kind of hard to get up for those games. Um, you know, guys mentioned it's it's one of those where, you know, the road team is going to feel better about it. You know, it's quiet. They're coming in with a chip on their shoulder already, especially when they're the underdogs that much. And uh, they just strolled in and took the lead. And I mean, yeah, we're sitting there in the last 15 minutes of that game, sitting there thinking, well, I don't know if they're going to find a goal here, but it was just such a weird feeling, the atmosphere. I think the loudest person I heard in the stands was, at one point, Darren Neal's made a crack at the official. Um, oh, I did not hear that then, on the broadcast. Yeah, I couldn't understand what he said. He just recognized the voice. Uh, and then, like, Andre Gonzalez Perez, as the game got on, became one of the loudest people in the stadium. That doesn't surprise me. I, I couldn't pick his voice out, um, where I guess things were mic'd. I could hear the Charleston bench pretty clearly, and and Mike Anhauser's voice was was pretty clear. Um, other than that, it, it was kind of just you know a cacophony of of voices. I've got a question for you that's come from Twitter, and since you did not hear the broadcast, I would like to get your thoughts on this first. Uh, John no Nair asks: Should regulation have been called when it was when Charleston had possession? Um, at the three-minute mark, uh, it was three minutes of stoppage time. I believe the whistle was blown like three ten or something like that. Did you think that that was weird, strange, upsetting? Charleston did. Yeah, it was weird to me, and because of the way it was done, and because of the state of the game, we couldn't tell. Because, and you, I mean, Jason, you know that press box it's it's basically um, you know reconstituted shipping containers. It's hard to tell. What's what, where the line is? We weren't sure at first if maybe it was offside. He blew it dead for offside and then killed the half or killed the 90 minutes. And then, or we couldn't tell if he just killed 90 minutes in the middle of an attacking phase. The first one would make sense to me. Like, he if he was offside and you whistled it and we're at three minutes, Atlanta's going to have a free kick deep in their own half. We're just going to kill it and just call it. If there was not offside and he killed it in the attacking phase, I absolutely understand Charleston's gripe, especially when they had numbers. Atlanta stretched out. They got a chance to go kill this off with the last kick and pull, and pull a quadro poku. I absolutely understand why they would be upset if there wasn't an offside, if they just killed it. Yeah, I don't think there was an offside call made. Um, I'm actually trying to pull it back up. I, I thought that it was a little overblown in the reaction. Um, some of the Charleston actual... let their emotions get away from them as that game went on. Of course, and, and that's understandable in that moment. You have the lead for that long. You concede when you do. I, I'm watching it back now. So Charleston cuts out a pass at 92.55. They, they play a ball over the right. Robinson heads it down to Nagby. At 93, it's a one-on-one with Robinson and an overlapping runner that Breck Shea is trying to recover about 30 yards from goal. It's unclear. Um, They do go to... You do see Charleston players uh, yelling at the AR on the near side. You can't see the AR from the broadcast. So I don't know if a flag went up and a whistle was blown for that or not. It wouldn't really fit because that player was not played in as of yet. So Yeah, that's why awkward. I was so confused. Yeah, it, it, I didn't it, like it. And I, I under, yeah, I understand them being upset. I still think Charleston let their emotions get the best of them as that game went on. Um, it was really interesting without a crowd to hear, you know, Ian Svonson runs hot, dude. That's yeah. something I learned tonight. Ian Swanson runs hot because it, you know, there was a foul early in that game where he just – he let the ref have it. And I thought the ref tempered himself. He didn't he didn't start flashing cards whenever somebody cussed at him because then nobody would have – we would have finished the game with two players on the field. Um, neither one of them probably would have been the goalkeeper. But, uh, yeah, Swanson ran hot. Even, even on plays where he, there was a foul and he didn't – get mad you could hear the charleston players trying to keep his head on the game because when he was on 
He's such a unique weapon. Man, he ran hot tonight. Yeah. Yeah, he did. Um, so, John. I'm surprised uh, they didn't nip at his heels some more, to be honest. Oh, yeah, that's a good point. So, John, the question about should regulation have been called when it was, I mean, it could be. It's a little awkward. Um, without By the letter of the law, to... yes. I don't like that they did it. Yeah, it's not even a letter of the law situation. Um, it, it's just without seeing the full picture, I don't know what the AR's involvement was, if there was something mm-hmm. that was flagged or you know, recommended for a whistle or, or there was miscommunication between the two. It was strange. Um, it was not as big of a chance as I think it was made out to be. But we don't know because it didn't develop. Um, it was very awkward, is, is the way I would put it. A um, couple more questions. We've got audio from Frank DeBoer as well. We've got audio from uh, the, the goal scorer Brandon in Vasquez. extra time, Brandon Vasquez. Elliot Beaven asked, what do you think of Ambrose not in the starting lineup? I don't really know. Um, I, I asked Frank DeBoer about that. Oh, okay. So we will find out about that because yeah. I mean, what did I think? I, I wondered maybe if Breck Shea was brought in because of Svantesson's height and to have an extra, you know, left back with with height to deal with set pieces really didn't end up mattering. I thought Shea had a really good first half. I thought he ran out of gas as the night went on. Uh, he he was really good in the first half. I thought he was fine in the second half. When you consider the fact that he played 120 minutes, I thought he played a hell of a game. Um. Because he was still making, he was still running up and down that side when he could. But you could tell, you could tell those guys who were out there for 120 minutes just didn't have the legs. Romario Williams popped a hamstring or a groin or whatever. I think it you was could a see groin. Romario. Yeah, you could see Romario limping at the end. He was trying to gut it out so the team didn't play down a man, and was doing everything he could. But you could see him favoring it. The the, the fight tonight from both teams, honestly. Because I thought Charleston's goose was cooked in about the 85th minute. I thought their legs were done, and I wasn't sure they were going to even get to 90 minutes. The fight that both teams showed was incredibly impressive, especially when Charleston concedes in stoppage time, in extra time, and then puts one in the back of the net, but he was offside, and then hits the underside of the crossbar, and it stays out. Yeah. I don't know how they mustered that, but when that ball hit the, end of the underside of the crossbar, I think that was the end of the night. Even before Vasquez puts that third goal in, I think that was the last gasp for Charleston. That was everything they had left. Yeah, 100%. I, I totally agree. Uh, Jacob Austin said everything about tonight was weird slash awkward. Yes. I think, I think a closed door match will, will do that to you. It, it was weird not being there. It was weird not calling it, that's for sure. It's a lot harder to type out a game as it is to uh, talk through a game, I've learned. Yeah, it was... It was weird t- typing about it. I mean, it's weird sitting there talking with people in the press box and listening to LGP down below you yelling things at <laughs> the ref and yelling at, you know, Miles Robinson for encouragement. Um, saw, uh, saw Brad Guzan's shiny head from below yes. us as well. Julian Gressel was there. I mean, it was it was a host of characters, but it was it was such a weird match. But damn, that was a gritty performance. Yeah. Like, I mean, you had to break it down. Thing. That's the thing that that I think gets lost in the shuffle a little bit from some of the immediate reactions is, yes, it's a USL championship team, but that's the, the power of a cup competition. You see it in the FA Cup. You see it in the Copa del Rey. You see it in Copa Italia. You see it in, in every cup competition. This is the game of the year for the little guy, and the, the, the big team is in a no-win situation. If you win, you're supposed to win. If you struggle and win, well, what's wrong with you? Something's broken. Like, uh, you can't do that. And if you lose, I'll forget it. Then, I mean, everybody should just immediately be fired. It's it's a tough situation. These games are not that easy. You have players for the Charleston Battery who are good players. Are they MLS-level yeah. players? There's a few who can play in MLS. But there's guys who, on a given night, can play toe-to-toe with you. And they did. They They put on a very good performance tonight. I was surprised at how good Charleston was tonight. I did not expect them to be as good as they were. I did not expect them to defend as well as they did. They were, I, I said it earlier, I, didn't, I, I don't know if I would use the word organized defensively because it was a little last-ditch scrambling at times. But it was, it was very just, I, I, think, I think the word I used was diligent. Like, they didn't quit. They, 
battled, and you had guys like Nelson and Van Shake just popping up in the right moments, and Taylor Mueller in the middle holding things down. Outside of the goal, Vasquez scored his first one. I thought Taylor Mueller really didn't put a foot wrong all night. That was just a little bit of miscommunication with Breno, and Vasquez gets in there and gets the touch and, and creates the space. And you have you have Mueller. Who, uh, the one that pops into my head is the ball over the top. I think it was PT or Carlton plays a ball over the top to Romario, and Mueller reaches out and just catches it with the side of his foot to knock it yes. away. Because if he plays it wrong, Yeah, one hundred percent, and and I think we might have lost Jared. And Mueller there had to make it. Mueller had to play it perfectly, and he did. I was very impressed with him tonight. Um, and then you mentioned Vasquez, and to me, Vasquez was. I was just very happy to see it from Brandon Vasquez because, uh, look, I mean, I've been as critical, I think, as uh, just about anybody over what we saw the last time Brandon Vasquez took the field for Atlanta United. Two, it was a mess. Um. His injury, he told us, was an MCL injury from a tackle in practice. He missed eight weeks. Mm-hmm. Tonight, he looked like the Brandon Vasquez that you that, that you signed, honestly. Like, he made good runs. He put the ball in the back of the net. He was calm with the ball in the biggest moment of the game and got around the keeper. I think he might have cussed the keeper, but he got around him. Yes. It, it, was, it was great from him. I was very impressed with what I saw from him. It was it's cool, man. Keep it up because right now, if Mario Williams is growing, really is pop. Uh, you got a hole to fill in that lineup in two weeks. I, in two weeks, <laughs> you got a hole or to fill in that week, lineup on me. Tuesday. Um, yeah. and that's the thing is now you've got you know a little bit of short rest before you head up to Columbus for the next match, and you're going to face a Columbus Crew team that will be uh, you know depleted as well. Federico Higuain out for the season. Will Trap, Jossie Zardes, Zach Steffen. Zach Steffen is now gone. He will be with Manchester City um, or on loan in Germany. Is what it's it. looking like. You hate to see that. Um, probably Joe Bendick in goal is what you're looking at for Columbus. We remember him. But Trap and Zardes will be away with the national team, and you have an opportunity to. to maybe get a little bit of revenge against Columbus after the loss at the end of March. That's on Tuesday night. After Trash that, ass field. well, it was that, that night. It was in March. Shouldn't yeah. be. It oh, no, shouldn't it should be, be on Tuesday. Not, However, not a fine stadium and a fine well, field. Just that well, night well, trash. well. However, the weather does not exactly look promising next week in Columbus. Oh, they're hover. So, yeah, no, just saying. Um, double A five stripes for the question for you, Jarrett. Were there any 17s around the stadium before or and or during the game? Were there people trying so, to get in? Go check my feed. I still put up a video. The dude was hitting the drums even after the game. There was somebody in the parking lot banging that drum the entire game. It was amazing. <laughs> I, I'm so I, proud. I, yes, I, I think that was Pay No Mind on Twitter. I, I believe it was. There was a question from Pay No Mind asking about the lone drummer. So I'm guessing maybe he was that he was there. said lone drummer. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Um, didn't see any fans. Uh, it was mostly, I think it was just players and family that was in the stadium. It was such a weird feeling. Yeah, it was obviously it's... really strange, but uh, I mean, it was, um, you, you, I, I liked the fact that everybody was still kind of locked into the game. That's cool. Yeah. And you, you can look, the Charleston people certainly were. The Charleston players seemed like they were just this, – this This was blood to them. They seemed to take whatever the hell happened in Charleston with the teams and with the field situation, they seemed to take it to heart because they came out looking like they wanted to put a hurting on Atlanta and make it a personal thing. And they played that way. Mm-hmm. I think their emotions got away from them a little bit at times, but – you know, honestly, that's the kind of emotional performance I always expect to see out of Orlando, the first half of the game especially, where it's it's running high, but it's under control. Meanwhile, usually Orlando just, like, runs out of control from kickoff. But uh, I love the fact that there was spiciness in between the fans and between the players. It, it was fun. I had fun with it. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's it's a cup game. Uh, that's what it felt yeah. like. Cause it felt like a team with something to prove and a team that was trying to show that they're the, the better team. And, and Atlanta struggled to match Charleston's intensity early on. And I think they did 
maybe from about the 30 minute mark on it was later in the first half and in the whole second half it felt like Atlanta found that extra gear that they were looking for Nathan Pugh on Twitter said they played well enough and were well on the front foot MLS opposition will prove more difficult but I think the team put out tonight along with how the draw fell has a chance to go deep in the tournament and that's what we learned this morning is you get this game against Columbus on Tuesday. If you win that, you're hosting a quarterfinal on July 10th, and you will be playing either St. Louis of USL Championship or FC Cincinnati, and you will be hosting that. Then you're playing the winner of the East Bracket, which could be uh, NYC, it could be DC United, um, could be Orlando, could be New England. Those are your four possibilities there. That's a manageable bracket, and we don't know who would host the semifinal. They haven't gone that far yet. That draw would be after the games on July 10th and the quarterfinals. But you would host a quarterfinal if you beat Columbus. The winner of that match will host that quarterfinal. So it's a manageable draw. I think now, you know, if you had any thoughts about well, you know, it's the Open Cup. We'll see what we get. We're not going to you know, really go for it. You saw Pitti Martinez tonight going for it. I, I thought Pitti played like this really meant something to him, and that was impressive in a, on a night with no fans in the stands and a midweek game against a lower division opponent. Pitti put the team on his back in the second half, in my opinion. Uh, the sheet had him with eight chances created, which led the team. Yeah, he had four in the first half, four the rest of the match. Um, Six shots, three on target. I thought Pitti was outstanding, and and I thought he really tried to carry this team when they needed somebody to. Uh, Mr. Green on Twitter, tough, gritty win. Charleston was up for this match, especially after what transpired the past two days. I felt like we could have scored a couple more goals if we had the right weight on a couple more passes in the final third. Well, if Justin Merrim had, had put away that header, it's lights out. That was an yeah. unbelievable ball from Pitti, and, and Merrim just puts it straight into the ground, which is what you're supposed to do. Not quite that much into the ground. <laughs> yeah, he spiked that one. Yeah, and, yeah it happens. Um, the Colonel, one side advanced, the other did not. I'd be fine with the same 11 and 18 in Columbus and would expect a 90-minute result. I would, too. I think the biggest question is Romario Williams. And is he going to be able to be in that 18 and be in that 11 on Tuesday? You it's, don't have the same. There's no way to know. No, right and you now. don't have the same. Uh, you can be looking at a different team. I mean, do you? Uh, does Gordon Wild? Um, I was know, push in training. And I was I was expecting him to be possibly the late fourth sub. I wasn't sure if it was. I'm fine with the Parky move. I was fine with that. I have no beef with that. Uh, Franco had to be exhausted. Speaking of which, like Franco had to be just gassed. I, cause what do you think I of him tonight? Believe. Because there were questions. There were questions. I didn't like the, the giveaway that leads to the first goal is him trying to dummy a ball and um, it, it doesn't go his way. He ends up falling to Svantesen. I thought I couldn't tell. I, I got to go back and look. Because Cam came out of his goal to play that to Franco. I thought the ball to Franco was – it. Was, Franco was under pressure, but it's nothing he hasn't dealt with before. And then I couldn't tell if Cam was just if, – if how quickly that play developed. He just wasn't back in goal yet. And he damn near got a piece of that ball from Svantesen. But, um, you know, Franco was just up and down tonight, I think. And I thought they did a good job of uh, – I thought they did a good job of trying to limit Franco. And I thought he did what he could. But it wasn't, it wasn't the same Franco I think we're used to seeing. But even – it's one of the – I think it's one of those things like, you know, a, a – a bad day of fishing is better than a good day of work. A, a bad day of Franco Escobar is better than a good day of a lot of guys. Yeah, it's a play that, w- that when he loses it, it's a play that he's pulled off many times. I'm looking back at the first goal now. Breck Shea plays it back to Can. Takes a little bit of a heavy touch, swings it over to the right. Escobar tries to let it run. It's taken away from him by Patterson. And, yeah, there's really not much Can can do looking back at it with how fast it, it developed. Um he plays it to Escobar, lets it run through his legs. Patterson reads it, wins it. Good ball from A.J. Patterson to Svantesen. He hits it first time. You know, Can, really once Patterson Cam's wins it, tonight. Can is, is getting back into the goal. And, yeah, it's not on Can. It's on Escobar. 
The only thing you could say about Can is just at that point, maybe you just blast it upfield and, and reset early in the game while you're trying to build some rhythm. I liked his distribution, by the way. It was good. When, yeah. when uh, this, it, it, I don't know. I, I need to go back and like watch games from the first season because I feel like his distribution's gotten a lot better from when he came here in 2017. And it's one of those things you watch how it can. He made a great save in the second half, in, uh, uh, in stoppage time. Um, on the goal that's called off, that's that's ruled offside, he makes a great low save to his left in the yes. first place just to keep that ball out. Alec yeah. Can, I'm I'm still kind of wondering. I'm still kind of curious how some team has not uh, snatched up Alec Can to give him a shot like starting. That, There's so many goalkeepers. Yeah. There's not a lot of spots. I mean, there yeah. there's so many teams that have goalkeeper battles, and there's so many teams that have good number twos that they feel like could be number ones and and then you know you do get people who say that well Atlanta has a big drop off I think without you know splitting time you're gonna have a drop off because Alec Can's not playing regularly so it's hard not to have a drop off when he comes in goal but when he plays regularly as we saw in the first half of, of 2017 and when he's been called on since he's delivered I think Alec Can has delivered, and I do agree. I think his uh, his possession work and his distribution has gotten better. A um, couple more, and then I'm going to let you go because I'm sure you're exhausted. And no, we'll I'm hear on the from... road, so I don't care. Okay, well, that works too. We'll hear from Frank DeBoer <laughs> as well before we finish up. Uh, Jeremiah Prescott chimes in on Twitter and says, Charleston bunkered like crazy but was decent on the counter. Atlanta created okay against the bunker but was slow and predictable at first. That was the the story on the broadcast was that they were too predictable. I really didn't see that until, or not even until, I didn't really see that after, God, pretty early in the first half, honestly, after the goal. Once the goal happened and Atlanta picked up the intensity a bit, I didn't think it was slow and predictable. I don't know. Maybe that's just me. Um, Jeremiah continued, eventually we moved the ball more quickly and created better chances, ultimately got a deserved win. Merrim was great. A- Atlanta was the better team. They they deserved to go through here. Um, they took more of the initiative. Charleston, I think, bunkered too much too early, and it cost them. I just don't think they're quite good enough defensively to do that. I thought they were dangerous on the counter, and I thought when they oh, yeah. they did get out, and then press a little bit that they were effective in doing it. And I'm a little surprised they didn't do more of it because I think they were more effective than in those moments than if they sat back and defended deep. Um, Patrick is, is fired up. I think their legs Pat- were gone oh, by, by late in the game when, when it became a thing. Hold on. Patrick is fired up because, no, we, didn't, we did not finish no, sorry, and, and answer the question. Um, oh. It wasn't exactly a question. Uh, Patrick tweeted, Escobar was bad. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I, I think I asked you the question, what you thought of Escobar. I didn't think he was great. No, not at all. Uh, I said a bad day of Franco Escobar is better than a good day of a lot of guys. But Yes. Um, I will continue with what Patrick Franco said. He, he said Escobar was not good tonight, didn't add almost anything to the attack, and apparently was told to stay up extra high. Well, I think he stayed up high because you were chasing the game at that point. So that that's a little bit of the game state. Once once you conceded, he had to push forward more and stay up high. He didn't add much to the attack, and that was a little surprising. I think, and, and I was surprised by it because we talked about it in the pre-match. I thought Atlanta would attack that side with Patterson. They didn't. They really went down the other side more often, and that's where Pitti Martinez was finding space. So I don't know if it's as much of Escobar just – you know, not seeing as much of the ball, but no, he wasn't involved in the attack. He didn't really add anything to it, and he gave a, a ball away that led to a goal. If you're if you're scoring him at home, I would probably give him a four, and That's that would generous. be the first four that. that I've given Franco Escobar maybe in his whole time in Atlanta. It, it's yeah. it, it happens, it happens. He was no, he was not good tonight. I, I'll agree with that, Patrick, but it happens. And that's that's part of the thing that I think sometimes when a player is just not good on the night, that's what it is. That's all it is. It's nothing more. And I think at times it's it becomes a storyline when it's not. I mean, Franco Escobar was not good tonight. He was not his usual self. You needed more from Franco Escobar. You didn't need what happened on the goal. That, that's I mean, that's what I got for Patrick. That's what I got for you. So 
not trying to be snippy or anything at all. Like I'm, I'm with you. I just, I don't think he was good, but I think it's probably as simple as that. And he needs to be better in the next match. Man, PT and Breck, Breck, by the way, had like acres of space to work down the left too. Good lord. Yeah. Yeah, Pitti moved over there and found the space. I thought Dion Pereira was really ineffective, and maybe that's one reason Pitti went to that side and, and started to find mm-hmm. opportunities and create some overloads because it just it wasn't really working for Dion outside of the 1v1 situations. That was really the only times he was contributing. Um, Michael Buckaloo says, if you have to start Williams or Vasquez next round, who do you pick? Vasquez looked better than me, and this is Michael, but obviously he was on fewer minutes. Williams was also hurt by the parked buses. Just from what we know right now, I would start Vasquez because I don't think Williams could give you 90 minutes. I don't think Williams give you 90 from. minutes. And if I'm playing hot hand, I'm playing Vasquez because the last few times we've seen him, Vasquez scored for the twos last time out on a nice ball by Patrick O'Conquo. Uh Williams just – and correct me if I'm wrong and call me out for it. That's fine. I just – I haven't been over the moon with Williams lately. No, he was better tonight than he has been, but, yeah, yeah. he didn't give you a ton. Um, I would start Vasquez if he – I, I want to know where his fitness is. I, I don't think he's 90 minutes right now, and that would be my biggest concern about starting him, but you don't really have any other options. I don't think Williams is going to be 90 minutes. I would be very tempted to, on Saturday, give Gordon Wild 45 minutes up top and play a similar type of shape and say, Gordon, uh, it's an open audition. Let's see what you got. And play him Which, in that role up top in a four two three one or four three three and see if, if he can give you anything. And if he can give you if you play him for forty five, you would think that you'd be able to get a good bit out of him on, on Tuesday. So I wouldn't play him more than forty five, but I would want to see him in that role to see if, if he can help me. If I can get Vasquez for seventy five and get Wild to finish it, I'd take it. The only other name that comes to mind off the top of my head is a guy like Okonkwo, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, and that's a possibility too. Now, Patrick would, would, you have to is... sign, would you have to sign him to a, a, nope. a U.S. Open Cup, or is he, is he on a reserve roster spot? The he's, first team? He's, a, he's an MLS player. Um, yeah, okay. I don't know. But I know last with... year you signed Yosef to that short that, that one game deal. and But he was not an MLS player. Yosef was yeah. on an Atlanta United 2 contract. Patrick Okonkwo was a homegrown contract. So you know, I, you, been yeah, I would be, tempted, he might make an 18 because of the injuries. He, he very well could make an 18 and, and you're in the 18. You never know what could happen. You never mm-hmm. know what possibilities happen in the match. Um, I'm going to hit some more from Twitter. We'll go a little, a little more rapid fire. Ricky Ricardo uh, responding to Rachel Affleck. Rachel Affleck says, I think we can say Williams, Carlton and can did not help themselves at all tonight. Might be time to move on. I'd say that's harsh, especially on Carlton. Uh, I thought Carlton gave you not the complete performance you would like, but I didn't think he hurt himself tonight. I didn't think Can hurt himself at all. Um, I thought Can was fine. Williams didn't help himself, and, and Williams Can, nothing Can could do about that goal. No, made a, made a, I, I, I agree. I agree. Um, and Ricky Ricardo says that that Can's the one he disagree with. I. I would disagree with Carlton, too, for sure. Um, I don't think you need to move on from any of them because of where you are right now. You're, I mean, your roster's full. <laughs> like that's, that's where you're at at the moment. Your roster's full outside of a reserve roster spot. Frank DeBoer did mention after the Chicago game that he was looking to upgrade on the roster. He's going to have to clear a spot to do that. If that's what Rachel's getting at, then yes, it is possible that you see a move to create spot to bring in somebody else. That's all I we know. Carlton was. I Carlton's I Carlton not one I would had, move. No, I thought he. I thought he had a couple moments of flash where he was dangerous. I just. I, I, I don't know. I think it was one of those things where he just he was not MLS fit for ninety minutes, and this had a very MLS vibe to it. Like it was an open cup game. I mean, but Charleston, Charleston didn't treat this like a USL match, and I think uh, Carlton struggled with the the fitness and the physicality of it for a full ninety. And that's why Frank pulled him when he did. I, I thought he was wearing down. Yeah. And, yeah. and you want to get Andrew to a point where he can play 90 minutes fitness with that group. But I thought when Carlton was at his best in this match, and, and it was not like very limited, I, I thought he was good for fairly long stretches. I thought Carlton absolutely belonged in this team. He was better than Dion Pereira tonight. Mm-hmm. And 
and and I know that's Dion who's got to be fighting for minutes. Really good games, but yeah, Andrew Carlton was better than Dion Pereira tonight. It was a different role, but Carlton was more effective. Um, Shiva said, "Seems like we kept attacking down the left. Same pass, same play, and too predictable in the final third. Uh, you were creating chances out of it, and that's the thing. Is like I know it's it's." That was the the commentary, and I I know that you did attack down the left a lot, but you were you were putting in good crosses from that side, and you were creating opportunities. Like when you're finding success, except in the conversion at the end of it, you don't necessarily want to go away from that. No, and you were getting plenty, and and you were getting plenty of space to do so, and then you had you know situations where you know Breck and PT are combining and you're, you get to a point where you're creating not just, you know, these, these wide crosses, you had a couple of them where you were getting in on the, in the end line and being able to play that hard ball back to the middle of the box. You had a couple of them where it was dangerous. It was dangerous. Excuse me. Yeah, I agree. It, I agree. it wasn't just, it wasn't just wildly pumping crosses into the box. Like you've seen this team do. No, it didn't feel like that at all. And that's where I think when you're talking about it being predictable, that to that was me my fear was would what be was my happen. definition of predictable. It didn't feel that way tonight. It felt like it felt thoughtful when crosses were being delivered from out wide and they were put into dangerous spots. And, and I thought Pitti was not just putting a ball in and seeing what would happen. He was picking players out, sometimes at the back. Sometimes to the near post, he was trying to like almost force movement off the ball to the post that he he, was, he saw and he was trying to play it to. I and, and Patrick continued. Patrick said Pitty was on and off, wish he was a little more consistent. I think the segments where Pitty, where people would say Pitty was off, were very short and very small. And I think the segments where he was on were were pretty long. I mean, I don't. I don't know what else Pitti could have done except score one of the, the Golossos on the chances he had. I mean, he had 65 passes on the night, uh, completed them at 74%, but he's not a guy you're trying to complete passes at 90%. He's not playing the Darlington Nagby passes. He's playing the, the more difficult, hopeful balls. 23 crosses, and a bunch of these were from set pieces as well. Nine were considered good. Ten open play crosses, four good ones. He created eight chances. Too. The the free kick was on goal and forced the, the save of the night. I thought Pitti was really good. And, and I think there's a scale of, of good, bad, consistent, not consistent from him because of the price tag. I, I really do think if he was, you know, Jim Smith, that you would look at his performance and say, wow, but because of the transfer fee, there's a different expectation. And that is that is sports. And that is understandable. But tonight, I just didn't see as much inconsistency out of him. I, I thought he was good. I thought Carlton, Patrick says Carlton did well. I thought he did well for, for good stretches. He didn't do well for long enough. And I'm with you, Jared, in that I think that the pace wore him down a little more than you would have liked. Yeah, it was just, I think he just got worn out by it. And I think Dion did too a bit. And Dion got frustrated because... He said, aside from those 1v1s, it wasn't really there for him. And I thought it would be more so for all of them, just because when they got packed in, you saw PT making runs. You saw Dion making runs at times. You saw uh, Darlington making runs, trying to break that defense and trying to trying to bend uh, Charleston's shape. I thought they did a good job of keeping their shape for the most part. And you said it earlier, they just found a foot at always the right spot to reach out and intercept or deflect the pass. It was impressive from Charleston. The question for me now is, like, you got up to this game, you played 120 minutes, and you just had your heart ripped out. What the hell are you going to do Saturday? You're going to have to sign the Greenville Triumph to go out there and just back your team up right now because no, those guys are going to be exhausted. Uh, yeah, I know. The those open guys cup hangover be, is real. The, the be, open cup be hangover when you're a lower division up. team and you get knocked out, it is real. It It, it hits you, and... After the week they've had, and Justin Merrim talked about it a little bit, about how, how difficult the week was on the Atlanta side with the travel and the bus rides, it wears on you. And when you have that opportunity and you feel like, man, we're going to go through and we're going to beat Atlanta in their own house after what happened, yeah, we're excited, yes. And then you and get you go up punched early. in the gut. Yep, you get punched in the gut, it hurts. 
it hurts you, and they're going to have we're going to see a lot of what they're made of on Saturday in Tampa Bay. Um, Atlanta scores what basically, and not to say that it's exactly that because I'm not trying to start a fire with this. It felt like the kind of set piece goal the Red Bulls score where. We're going to play that corner a little long to somebody big. He's going to head it back into the mixer, and it's going to find the back of the net. Hell or high water. See, Joe Boss is learning the uh, the dangers of a cup competition. So just got home. Oh. Thank God for Brandon Vasquez. How can the defending MLS Cup champs missing some pieces and need extra time to beat middle of the pack USL club? I'm disappointed, happy. Because it's the Open head. Cup, baby. It's the Open Cup. Uh, it's you're talking about Atlanta United, yes, missing a significant piece in Joseph Martinez, missing Tito Vialba, missing Leandro Gonzalez Perez, missing Julian Gressel. Ezekiel those are Barco. Ezekiel Barco, yeah, those are that's five big pieces. You're missing that, and you're playing a team that is up for the game. You're playing a team that's a, a good professional team, and in Charleston, a manager who's been there forever. They they know what they want to do. There's no questions about philosophy or style or system. You're playing a team that now, after what happened on Tuesday, it's, is angry. <laughs> and they want revenge. They didn't want to have to drive over to Kennesaw to play this game. They're fired up. Yeah. It showed. You could feel that edge. So that is a great equalizer at times. You take those five players out from Atlanta, you add the anger to it, and you add just the, the sprinkling of U.S. Open Cup dust, and you get games like this. It happens in, uh, in all countries. It's tough. Because, again, you have nothing. It's a no-win situation for you. Oh, man, I don't know. It's going to be um, it's going to be interesting what they look like Tuesday night. I wouldn't expect, if I had to lay money on it, I wouldn't expect you to have Tito for this game. So what does it no. look like if you're Atlanta? Because um, Tito is still in, Argentina, still, is still in Argentina. He's not back yet. No, no. And I mean, he's still not 100%, I would imagine. Right, right. So you're looking at this... Um, Okay, we go back to the bench, and, and you look to potentially Brandon Vasquez up top. We talked about that. Uh, Mikey Ambrose for Breck Shea, you could see that if Breck needs to come out. Justin Merrim starting for Dion Pereira, you could see that, especially back in Columbus and, and after the performance that, that Justin had tonight. Michael Parker starting for Florentine Pogba, yeah. Or Franco Escobar if you needed Michael it. Michael Parkhurst was the most dangerous player in the attack at the end of that game because well, he's the only one that had legs. That's true. Um, He's Eric, cutting through that Charleston midfield like a hot knife through butter, and I yeah. was dying the whole time. Eric Rometty starting in the the holding midfield. Yep, he's he's going to be fresher. So yeah, that's a very strong possibility. Gordon Wild getting minutes or starting that could happen. Um, I think it looks like this team with Rometty, Merrim, and Parkhurst starting, and Vasquez likely starting up top for Williams. I think those are your changes for Tuesday. I'd be fine with that. I mean, I, I'll be curious to see if we see Michael, uh, Mikey Ambrose Saturday. Um, there's, yeah, I would too. Tafka chimed in, and it happened in the the commentary as well when I was typing. Uh, he said, pitty has got to stop that, quote, stop everything for 10 seconds when I think I've been fouled, unquote. It's driving me crazy. Throw your hands up and complain, but stay with the damn play. It was specifically about a play where Pitti Martinez was just, like, held. <laughs> yeah, he was pulled it, back physically. It like, was as blatant there's, 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 of a foul as complaints. I've seen that wasn't called. You'll see people eye roll whenever it happens, whenever he gets nudged off the ball or something. And I've talked to Felipe Cardenas about this, about, you know, what PT, when he was, he mentioned before, when PT was in Argentina, he was used to getting all the calls. This is a different world for him where, you know, he's not getting the calls. He's getting treated like a rookie, to be honest. But yeah, there's been a couple fouls this year where PT's been legitimately fouled or held back, and it just isn't called. And I think he gets upset at the little ones that he's used to getting, and he's incredulous at those. And I don't blame him on those because they're legitimate fouls. Mm-hmm. He was held back. Like, if you want to argue the little bumps and the pullbacks, okay, cool. He was legitimately pulled back. He's been legitimately fouled with it, having not been called before. That one, those, I'm totally on board with him getting upset about. I completely understand. Yeah, there, there's an element to it, too, that you have to understand the, the Latin soccer culture and the mentality of how you're you are constantly working the referees it's the same thing when people get fired up with Leandro Gonzalez Perez talking a lot 
and being demonstrative with referees. Still the loudest he, guy at the game tonight. Well, <laughs> he, he didn't have a chance to go like walk with the referee starting the second half and have a long conversation and, and mellow out and all, all those sorts, sorts of things. There is an element to working referees. It, it's, it's real. You can, you know, it, it's just something you have to understand. Part of working referees are some of those moments. Where in that situation, and, and that's one that I mean, Tafka specifically mentioning uh, continue to play. I think it was the moment where he was pulled back. Pitti stopped because he was pulled back. He was making a point that, hey, ref, you missed this. And I think the referee gave a makeup call at midfield right after that. <laughs> uh, you could it, hear LGP screaming on that non call, by the way. Like yeah. that was the most audible thing in the stadium, was that raspy scream in the argentine accent yeah i didn't hear it because i was was. screaming because i was like what i think i scared gwen at that point but we all knew who exactly who was screaming to all of us in the press box like oh leandro's here tonight cool but going down and staying down sometimes or in that situation you know making it very clear to the referee that you disagreed especially in a game like tonight where it is a usl level referee there is an element of working the referee and it has to be understood. It's not laziness. It's not a bad attitude. Pitti Martinez has taken a beating so far in this league. Um, Bob Bradley talked about it with Carlos Vela after the Portland game. And Pitti Martinez has been fouled like that. Ezekiel Barco has been fouled like that. Ezekiel Barco has been fouled like that for two years now. Ironically, that, Barco gets calls, too. Uh, yes. Yes. Not a he's, ton. He's not, getting, not for everything, but he's, he picks up a fair number of whistles. He gets fouled more than he gets called, but now, yes, I, he's getting, he's starting to get them. Um, before he left, he was starting to get them. Last year, he did not get them. We'll see what happens. I, I, in my opinion, that gets overblown. But I'm also just, I'm coming at it more from a, a long term perspective. When I see it, I kind of, I have that mentality of, okay, he's trying to make a point to the referee. He's staying down to make a point, or he's, he's being demonstrative to make a point. LGP does it. Escobar does it. Lots of guys do it as as a point. So I don't think of it in the same way. But that's that's just that's different ways of looking at the game. Whatever it is, referees and, and Pitti Martinez are not on the same page. <laughs> and hopefully one day no. that will happen because it's frustrating for all concerned when they're not on the same page. Uh, Ricky Ricardo chimed in with a bunch of stuff. I, I, I won't talk about number one, and, and Ricky Ricardo knows why I won't talk about his number one point. Number two, we played like we didn't care. Passes were lazy, tons of crosses like we didn't have ideas. It was very hard to watch, and Charleston wanted it more. I disagree with part of it. Played like we didn't care up until the goal. The intensity wasn't there early. It needed to be there sooner. Um, that was an issue. Passes were lazy, tons of crosses like we didn't have ideas. Tons of crosses because they were effective. There were a lot of good crosses. So that's, that's one thing for me here. Charleston bottled up the middle. It's why you can't concede early. It's why you can't concede the way you did. Very hard to watch. I didn't get that mentality. I didn't get that feeling. I, I'm also just – it's a little different for me, like my investment in it, obviously. So I didn't get that it was hard to watch. It felt like Atlanta was banging on the door, and I felt like a goal was coming. So I wasn't like – this is bad. That's just me. Charleston wanted it more. I, I disagree. I, the wanted it more thing is, is really hard to define. I think Charleston early on had more intensity. And Absolutely. that was a problem for Atlanta. And you, you can't get into that situation because against a lower division opponent, you know they're going to come in and have that intensity. Yeah, and they just they shelled up. And like I said, I think I, – I think Charleston realized they can do that little bit of a press, just opportunistic press and give Atlanta fits. But I think by the time late in the game, when they could really try and exploit Atlanta, I think their legs were going on them and they just couldn't do it. Cause Charles, like I said, to me late in that get late in regulation, Charleston's legs looked gone. Now they, they yeah. got, a, I think they got a little bit of a pep from the break they got a little bit of a more of a pep from the goal that Vasquez scored when they almost scored twice. But I think their legs were gone and they just bunkering it, bunkering and trying to counter was the only thing they could do. And even there were points late in that game where they get out on the counter on, you know, a two on one and you see them pull it back. Cause they just, it, it just looked like they couldn't do it. 
Yep, they just they, they couldn't run anymore. I mean, they hit a wall, and it showed. Uh, they found one more burst after conceding the, the, the go-ahead goal, and they shot their shot, and they could not find it. Um, can with a big save, and then the one off the bar, it was just like, oh, no, this is going to go to penalties. Oh, wait a minute, no, it's not going to go to penalties. Thank you. Did not want to deal with penalties. Yep. yep. <sighs> Ball off the bar to me was the end of the game. That was at that point. We're done here because that's everything you had. Yeah, that that was it. Um, run through uh, the final stats. A couple more things to, to mention. Um, possession gained. Miles Robinson was outstanding tonight. Miles Robinson, oh, I thought, was <laughs> outstanding. Gained possession 14 times, lost possession seven times. He led the team in tackles, led the team in clearances. He was an absolute beast. The box out king, baby. Yeah, yeah, he, uh, he, multiple he, times, absolutely. He had a couple box outs in that game that were just, I was just blown away by. Yeah. Uh, Pogba was good. I, I think Pogba was pulled for you know tactical reasons. You had to go for it at that point, but I thought Pogba was, was fine. He was very vocal tonight, too. was very positive, very vocal about, the, you know, everybody, okay, guys, let's, let's, Let's get him moving. Let's. Uh, I thought he was a good. I thought he was a good vocal leader. Um, seems to have kind of slotted into that team, especially with the second team and now with the first team. This guy who's, you know, who's been around the block, who, you know, not necessarily, you know, playing the always the highest levels, but he understands, especially cup competitions. I think, and uh, he seems to just fit in nicely. Uh, three shots on target from Pitti, from Romario, from Vasquez on the night. Pogba had a shot on target, <laughs> nearly snuck one in on the back post. Uh, Breck Shea had a shot on target, took a deflection. Yeah, mauled on that save. play, by the way. Yeah, he did. Um, Carlton with a shot on target as well. Overall, I, I, I've seen comments that they did not deserve to win. <laughs> Joe Boss says, I'm new to this, guys. <laughs> yeah, Joe, the cup, oh, man, it's always chaos. Just expect chaos when it's a, a cup competition. Just expect the it. cup Just, is the most beautiful, dumbest thing you'll ever experience. Yeah, it's it's wonderful and chaotic and crazy all at the same time, and it, it'll make you cry and it'll make you laugh and it'll make you smile and and throw things out of uh, happiness and anger and sadness all at the same time. That's that's the cup. Um, go ask New Mexico United about the cup. That was a wild one last night. Um, okay, so where does Atlanta go from here? They get a little bit of rest. They prepare for a trip to Columbus. They play Columbus in the round of 16. Winner of that will host the winner of St. Louis FC of the USL Championship and FC Cincinnati. On That'll be on July 10th in the quarterfinal. Game next week, it's on Tuesday night for Atlanta and Columbus. It will be available on ESPN+. Plus. There will not be a radio call again Maybe we will figure out a location to do the uh, pregame and postgame live um, on Tuesday night uh, since this went over fairly well. Um, I was glad that, that people found it. I was glad people checked it out and really enjoyed all the, the interaction with you guys. We're going to save the Frank DeBoer audio for the morning since it's late and we're all going to go crash now. Jarrett, thanks for grabbing the audio. We've also got Brandon Vasquez audio that we'll have in the morning. We'll be back normal time, 9 a.m., uh, 9 to 11 in the morning, previewing. We've got U.S. Women's National Team to talk about. They play this weekend. We've got some Copa America that kicks off tomorrow. We've got the Gold Cup that kicks off this weekend. we got lots of stuff to talk about, even on a non-MLS weekend preview show. We've got some prize pick stuff to talk about. The Women's World Cup's on prize picks now. Ooh. Yes. Yes, it is. I um, am hoping that Nick's Italian forward, Barbara Bonansea, is, is going to get some goals tomorrow. I think she will. I am I am picking Italy to beat Jamaica tomorrow, and that would be very helpful for me. We'll see what happens. We'll talk prize picks in the morning as well. Lots of stuff. Thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll talk to you guys in the morning. Mucha plata, y'all. Ooh, I get to do this for the first time in a while. Mucha plata, y'all. <laughs>